Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar. This is Dina Johnson from JFK Partners at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. And today's topic is part two of this series, and it's entitled Ad Adaptations of Facing Your Fears for Telehealth, Schools, or Other Age Groups. Feel free to type questions or comments in the chat box at any time. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. Please be sure to mute your microphone and video so we don't have background distractions. We are recording today's event and we'll archive it on the JFK Partners website along with the other webinar in this series. We have already posted the handout for today on this page, so you are welcome to print or save for future reference. Um, we will put the link to today's handout in the chat box. Following the webinar, you'll receive a link requesting an evaluation. You may request a certificate of attendance in the evaluation. Now I'd like to turn it over to Judy Reben. Morning, everybody. Uh, welcome. This is part two. Um, we are really appreciative that you're able to join us this morning. We know that there are many things right now that are competing for everybody's attention. So we appreciate that you are uh, willing to hang out with us for the next uh, hour and 15 minutes or so. Uh, we want to give a special welcome to our fellow Colorado folks, just like we did last time. We noticed a, no a number of folks from Colorado are signed in, folks from across the country, and of course, our uh, friends and colleagues um, in Canada who joined us today. Um, as Dina said, this is part two. So um, uh, you, if you were with us on part one, you know that um, it was more of an introductory uh, part to facing your fears, kind of really going over the core components and so on. So we really would encourage you, especially if you're new to facing your fears, to go back to the website, check out the original um, webinar and kind of fill in maybe some information that we're not gonna be able to cover today. Uh, this is when Audrey and I were chatting about it, we really felt like it was important to kind of share a little bit of some of our work that we've been doing, trying to adapt facing your fears for other kinds of contexts and populations. So that's what this is. We're gonna go through them. There's three, you know, we tried to be equal here in terms of the amount of time we're gonna spend. So there's sort of three main adaptations we're gonna cover. As you can see, it's telehealth, teens with um, ASD and ID and adaptations for schools. Uh, if all goes well, we're going to be able to be done with most of that by 11, and then we'll have the last 15 minutes or so for, um, for question and answer in the chat. Um, but you can see that we have our email right here. So it's, it's very possible we may not be able to answer questions, or you might have a specific question that you feel like you can't kind of put all together in a chat. So feel free to email us um, and we'll do our best to try to answer those questions. Um, before we get started, I think um, we do have one quick poll and we're just interested about who's in the audience. So I'm gonna have uh, Christine launch our poll, have you respond, and we'll just get a little feel for, uh, for who's listening in. And Christine, when the poll's done, I assume you'll uh, show it to us. So that's how I'll know when it's okay to keep going. Give folks a minute. There we go. We have, uh, oh, all right. Three quarters mental health folks, our fellow colleagues. Um, happy to have our family members and uh, as well as our non mental health folks, because you'll see we are gonna talk about the programs, especially the school-based program, um, which is specifically for um, interdisciplinary school teams. So we're happy to have all of us, uh, all of you join us. All right, thank you for that. Okay, so we wanted to start by doing a quick acknowledgement. You'll see we have a number of funding agencies over the years that have funded Facing Your Fears. The ones that have funded the projects we're talking about today are um, the Organization for Autism Research. Uh, that's the um, FYF uh, IDD program that Audrey's gonna be talking about. And HRSA has funded both the telehealth, our original telehealth project, as well as the school-based project. 
Um, and we do want to acknowledge uh, we have a conflict of interest in that we both receive royalties from the publication of uh, the Facing Your Fears manual, which we will be talking about today. All right, so these are the three chunks. You can see telehealth, um, adolescents with ASD and ID, and schools. So I'm gonna start right away with telehealth because I know that's on a lot of people's mind. I've been getting a lot of uh, emails about this, which I totally appreciate and understand because we are doing the same thing here ourselves. Uh, so what are the advantages of doing telehealth? I think, I think now, I don't know if I'd done this maybe a year ago, I think there might've been a few more people to convince, I suppose, but uh, these days I'm fairly confident we all are recognizing the advantages of telehealth. Um, is that families can receive the evidence-based interventions. Um, when we're talking about the, the Facing Your Fears program, sometimes it might require a decent amount of manpower to run a group depending on the size, but we found that when you do a telehealth version, you may not need as many uh, facilitators. Uh, obviously, telehealth can reduce barriers of transportation, time away from work, childcare, those things, and also can help keep people safe which, uh, in the time of COVID. Um, some folks might actually prefer this even when, when and if there is a time when we go back to seeing folks in clinics, there may be some families who, who say, I, I want to do a telehealth version regardless of um, what you might be offering in person. Um, so I think there is something to be said around sustaining this kind of approach over time. Um, and of course, reaching out to rural communities, but you know, even now we're reaching out to um, people in our own urban areas um, who, for many reasons, are um, including our own hospital policies, are unable to come in. So this, we're not new to the game, uh, and I guess that's maybe a, a kind of a main take on point. So our friend and colleague, Susan Hepburn, who's in the bottom right corner, um, had the idea a number of years ago to do a telehealth version of Facing Your Fears. Uh, and I want to say this grant was originally funded well, in maybe 2009 to 2011, something like that. Um, this was our original team. Uh, Susan called it the Telecopes team. Uh, kind of catchy, right? And uh, you can see some people you might recognize, Audrey and myself are in the bottom row, uh, Larry Edelman, Kristen Kaiser, and Dina Johnson were all part of that original team. Um, and so what the whole purpose of the uh, that project was to really try to figure out if we could even do this technologically. That's much less of an issue right now, but in those days, I don't know if you could tell, it was not by Zoom, it was by a platform called Ubu. Um, and that was what we were able to use that was both secure as well as reasonably efficient in um, reaching families uh, from their homes. So we had to spend some time thinking about what kind of support families needed even to stay connected. And again, that's, I think, much less of an issue right now, um, but it certainly was at the time. So other development activities uh, for that original project were to recruit families to participate, trying to figure out how to build an alliance. So there's a lot of mental health therapists on the, on the line here, and I know you've all been doing telehealth uh, since COVID, if not before, and it is challenging to build an alliance. Um, some folks prefer this modality, of course, but, um, you know, other times it's really hard to get a feel for how somebody might be thinking or feeling um, over, over Zoom. And I think we have to be mindful of that as we uh, run groups. Uh, again, the original part of that uh, telehealth project was to translate Facing Your Fears. This was before the publication of the manual, so we had to think about how we were going to um, modify it, if at all, for telehealth. And then, of course, deliver to families and then collect data. So this is a screen from one of our early times. You can see it doesn't look all that dissimilar from how many of our screens look right now. You can see the platform was Uvu. And for folks who know um, Facing Your Fears, you'll recognize those pictures. Those were uh, pictures from uh, the worry bug activities. And we didn't ha have them use Play-Doh, they just drew them. And uh, they, I don't think we even had the ability to share screens, but they held their pictures up to the, uh, to their webcams, and so we were able to get a good picture of, um, of what they've been working on. So the results from that initial trial um, were really pretty positive. Uh, we had good fidelity to the intervention as we developed it. Um, we had really good, strong completion rates. Parents were and kids were satisfied with the program. 
And preliminary efficacy indicated that um, anxiety, according to parent report, um, was significantly reduced from a baseline to post-intervention. And parents felt good about um, their sense of being able to work with their own children, which of course is what we've always wanted in the Facing Your Fears program anyway. Um, so it was really encouraging. But so now what have we learned all these years later from that particular project um, and uh, from a lot of what's going on right now with regard to telehealth? Well, the first thing we have to think about is, at least for the Facing Your Fears program, is who's appropriate. So the screening criteria is really similar to the um, clinic phase program is it's the same age range, uh, eight to 14, you want interfering anxiety. Um, and for this particular program, not intellectual disabilities, uh, the diagnoses uh, or at least symptom areas that we've listed are the ones that um, we feel like are, um, can benefit the most from the Facing Your Fears program. So that would be social anxiety, generalized anxiety, separation, and specific phobias at least as a primary problem. It doesn't mean that um, we don't work with kids that might have OCD or other um, psychiatric conditions. We certainly work with a lot of complexity, but in terms of primary presenting anxiety problems, it's usually best if it fits in those main areas. Um, our teams, and this is informed by some of our ongoing telehealth teams by um, Lisa um, Hayton and Caitlin Middleton and Lindsay DeVries, who've been doing active telehealth um, uh, facing your fears uh, in these, these last several months, um, are doing more conservative screening around um, the safety and crisis risks. Um, uh, you know, we can't, if we're not seeing kids in person, I think we want to be extra careful that we're not missing anything. So that might mean more in-depth questions for families about self-harm um, and other co-occurring symptoms like, um, like depression. Uh, we want to ask, it seems kind of logical, right? You want to ask how you think they do in a video format. And some of our kids are very um, apprehensive about being on camera. Um, I would say the majority are fine with it, but we certainly have had kids who do not want to be um, seen. And um, it doesn't mean they couldn't participate, I suppose, but it does mean we'd have to really try to work within that kind of context. Um, so you do want to check that out. And um, I, I, folks have asked me if there's any kind of criteria around if someone has a certain uh, anxiety presentation of somehow we would say, no, you can't do it by virtually. And um, I think it's probably an individual basis if, if you would feel like you've got um, a presentation, uh, someone you're working with has got an unusual presentation of an anxiety symptom as to whether or not you think it would be appropriate for telehealth. But I tend to be of the mindset that I feel like we can pretty much do any kind of adaptation, provided that families are willing to carry out the um, exposures because that's exactly what happens in, um, in a telehealth modality. All right, so getting started. Um, some of your initial steps are going to be as follows. You're going to want to make sure you know what video platform you have. Um, depending on where you work, you want to make sure it's, it's secure and HIPAA protected. Um, making sure there's uh, connectivity issues and that sort of thing. You might have to have to do kind of dry runs to make sure families are connected. But even in the best of circumstances, people fall off calls and all my internet is out actually for these last two days. And so that kind of stuff just, just happens without warning and you probably wanna have a backup plan for things like that if you haven't already figured that out. Um, helping families figure out where groups can happen so that it's private, especially if there's other kids in the home um, to be able to block out the time. You want to make sure all the workbooks, materials um, that you need for the duration of the program the families have access to. Um, this might seem like a, a smaller point, but it is relevant in that, you know, uh, we're assuming that people do have the Facing Your Fears program and that you do have the videos that are part of it. Um, but if people have those videos, uh, you may not have them electronically. You just might have them to be able to use with a, um, a DVD player. Some, many times these days, people don't have DVD players anymore, so you want to make sure that you do have a way to play the videos through your computer. Um, you want to be really planful about uh, what kids are going to be doing when you're meeting more with the parents, because as you'll see, one of the differences in this program as we, in the telehealth version, is we are much more weighted towards time with family members as opposed to trying to just mimic the, the um, clinic-based program. And of course, having good visual structure. Uh, in 2009, we didn't know there was a whiteboard function. There may not have been on Ulu, so we literally had whiteboard. But um, now you can use a whiteboard function of, of Zoom or other platforms that might um, 
serve the same purpose. So what does it look like? This is what it looks like. So the original program is 14 sessions. The telehealth version is um, at least 12. You can go to 14, um, but it may or may not uh, work well to have it be the, the full 14 session dosage. You can see the sessions are shorter than the clinic-based version. And um, the reason for that is um, maybe obvious uh, in that the kids have a hard time with um, staying on screen for a long time, um, which might seem counterintuitive, how excited they may be around video games and that sort of thing, but it is interpersonal interaction. And uh, we find that um, many of our kids kind of peter out um, after about 30 minutes. So you wanna budget your time carefully. Um, and the group size, it can be the same as what you might do in a clinic-based um, session, but um, you have to be careful about, especially when you get to the exposure session. So if you know this program, you know psychoed might be fairly easy to teach in a larger group, but when you start doing individualized hierarchies um, uh, for graded exposure practice, um, it's hard to provide individual attention for families. And so if you have the ability to have uh, breakout rooms to have a, one of the facilitators go with a couple of families and another with another set that could certainly work. Um, and again, as I've as I've been saying, you know, the original program we have like large group activities and parent-child dyads, and then we have separate child and parent groups. For telehealth, we found that um, it's really hard to think about doing a separate child group. Um, many families may not have access to two different computers, um, and it might be tricky to wrangle the kids for, um, for a substantial amount of time. So what we've really done is try to convert some of the content so that it's applicable to be done with parents and kids together and then parents alone. So that is one of the most significant differences, kind of a structural difference. Um, I, here's some intervention components. So psychoed is essentially the same. And as I, I said, it's more just how we deliver it that's a little bit different. Uh, show and tell, you know, if, if it's kind of a fun part, I know not everybody does all the show and tell pieces, but I think in, um, when kids are in their houses, they have lots of things they want to show off to you. They want to carry their computers around and they want to show you um, their pets and their rooms and their fun things that they have, which we think is really cool. But, um, uh, and it, we also, not that it's just cool, but it's also showing us another part of themselves um, that is a great strength that isn't just about anxiety focus, which as you know, is a major premise of how we approach this intervention. Um, another major difference is how we think about graded exposure. So you might in a clinic-based program do a lot of in-session practice. You can't really do that as easily over telehealth. So we've come up with a couple of different ways. And I know there are some folks who are actively doing this by telehealth now who might have some additional ideas. Some of the things we've come up with is that we've had families film it on their phones and upload it. Um, and it can be they upload it for everybody to see as part of a share time, or they upload it for the facilitators to see. Um, it increases accountability, and I think it's a super fun way to show your practice. Um, another way to go would be when you're doing in-session graded exposure is to identify a child of the week and it's their turn to kind of do a live graded exposure practice. You can imagine that you have to do some kind of planning to make sure that goes well. Um, so that the family knows what they're doing, the child knows what they're doing, there's a good reward system if you need one in place. But um, you can imagine the, the benefits of that with a strong audience effect. So kids are glued to their videos, they're to, you know, to the um, screen, they're watching other kids be successful, hopefully they're cheering them on. Um, so that I think is a really exciting um, potential benefit of this kind of modality because people are zeroed in on what you're doing and what you're working on. Um, in when we did the original telehealth program, we just didn't do have the kids make facing your fear videos in the way that we do in a clinic-based program. I would be curious if there are folks out there who have done that, and if so, if you found a way to have that happen successfully. Um, so that's that's just how we thought about that that component. And uh, finally, before I hand this over to Audrey, who's gonna talk about the IBD program, um, I am in the process of completing a telehealth guide. So the telehealth guide is, um, and for those of you who have maybe seen our individual adaptation, is essentially saying, if you've got the, the manual, here are the core components, 
And here's how we want you to think about converting activities from a clinic based to a telehealth based. Um, I'm almost done with it. It's not done completely yet, so which is why I can't offer it. But I'm happy to have you guys just email me if this is something that you are actively doing and are familiar with facing your fears. Shoot me an email and say that you are interested in the telehealth guide. I think I'm probably still a couple of weeks out before I, I can um, send it to you, but, um, but I think that will also be helpful in terms of structuring your sessions. So I'm gonna stop there. I know there may be questions, um, but I'm gonna turn it over to Audrey to talk about our, um, our teen groups and then we'll finish up with schools and then go to questions. Thanks, Judy. I'll jump in and talk about the teens with ASD and ID. Um, just to get started, we know that this population is a supremely underserved population. And there's so many reasons why this population is underserved, but a big part of it is um, challenges tied to psychiatric assessment of mental health conditions in this um, age group. It can be very difficult to tease apart what might be problem behavior for other purposes or anxious avoidance. Um, another big struggle, obviously, is access to qualified providers in our community. And what lots of providers have shared is they would be more than happy to um, embrace and treat individuals with ASD, IDD, yet they don't feel that there is adequate training in the community. We have very few manualized interventions for the ASD ID population. And that was in part what drove uh, Judy and I to really think about, would we be able to successfully adapt um, FYF for teens with ASD and ID. So what I'll tell you about right now is a pilot study that we completed. And the goal of this study was twofold. One, first of all, to see, is this an acceptable, feasible intervention? Do parents like it? Is there value meeting within the context of a group and serving um, families with ASD, ID, anxiety in that type of group treatment format. Much of the work that has been done in the ID population has been individually based, but we really feel like there's value of, uh, in the context of a group. There's support that can be um, attained and there can be great models. Um, we think about our population as being very socially isolated and a group can be a really nice forum for support and discussion. We also wanted to think, obviously, with this treatment have some initial efficacy. Um, we wanted to um, think carefully through the assessment process. There are not many normed psychiatric assessment instruments for this population, and that is a real struggle. What could be anxiety? What could be depression? What could just be negative affect underlying these conditions? And that's really hard to tease apart. Um, since the study, we completed the study about a year and a half ago, there have been new instruments and there continue to be um, big efforts put out um, to think carefully through assessment in this population. At the time that we did this, we conducted a functional assessment right in the beginning to attempt to differentiate behavior that was driven by anxiety as opposed to behavior that could be a byproduct of other functional causes. Um, we use the ADAMS, and the ADAMS is a instrument that has been created for the ID population. Um, and we use that as an entry point into the study and as an outcome measure. Um, we use the SCARED as well. And <laughs> The SCARED is not normed for an ID population, and there, have, there are lots of limitations. Several of the items are really tapping into um, children's voiced anxiety. The only reason we really used it was because we've used it in the other FYF studies, and we wanted to kind of have some degree of comparison um, tied to the treatment. How is it working relative to um, FYF that we have provided for other subgroups? So that's why we use the SCARED. We also included the FEAR survey schedule for children. This is Tom Allendick's measure that really focuses on specific fears and phobias, in part because this population has a heightened occurrence of specific phobias. So that's why we use that. Um, so moving along, um, as I mentioned, we really were focused on two primary aims in the study. 
is this study, is this adapted program feasible to implement and is it acceptable to families? So regarding the feasibility, we had 23 adolescent parent um, combinations um, join us for intervention and 19 out of the 23 successfully completed group. Parents rated the group very high and our parent acceptability ratings are very comparable to what we see in our traditional FYF group. When we look at the initial results, we were able to see through a linear mixed model analysis, nice reductions across the board on Adam. So not just on anxiety, but also on mood symptoms. Um, on the scared, we saw a reduction in the total scared score in addition to separation anxiety. And we saw a significant reduction of fears and phobias based on Tom Allendick's measure. So we have some nice kind of preliminary results to back um, the program that we have as of now. Um, but obviously there are many limitations to the study. It's a very small sample. Um, we did not have a comparison group and we are fervently seeking funding um, to really expand this program and really think carefully through um, the components and the results. So we do want to spend a teeny bit of time talking through who might be appropriate for this. So within our pilot study, we focused on that teen group in part because we felt like um, obviously they're an underserved group. Um, we see high rates of anxiety in the teen population, but quite honestly, we have also used this protocol with younger children and with adults. So the study itself focused on the adolescent population, but I feel strongly that it can be used and further adapted for other age groups. Um, the ID population is a very heterogeneous group. So we had IQ cutoffs, um, but honestly, I don't feel like they were very helpful. Our IQ cutoff was um, full scale IQ of 40 and we went all the way up through 70. Within that group, we had kids who had single words, phrase speech, and then we had other folks with completely fluent um, language. And so within the FYF um, adapted program, we really had to craft two sets of materials. One set of materials and activities really designed for teens with less developed language skills and a whole nother set of materials for those teens who had completely fluent complex speech. Um, we also modified our problem behavior criteria. So in the traditional FYF groups, we have um, more stringent criteria tied to problem behavior. We wanted to embrace teens with ASD and ID, and in doing so, we know that there are problem behaviors that go along um, with those diagnoses. And so we really broadened our inclusion criteria to state that we're okay if your teen has SIB, aggression, disruption, we want to be able to address what really underlies that. And for many teens, what can underlie the problem behavior are emotion regulation challenges and anxiety. Um, but we did have to have the, the behaviors be managed in group. We had several teens who we had to do kind of side by side um, work. So they started in group, their behavior was very difficult to manage. We had to kind of shift them over to individual that was run concurrently to group and then essentially as exposure, get them back into group. Um, so use good judgment tied to behavior because it can be very disruptive um, if the behavior is not manageable. So in terms of treatment adaptations, we maintain the 14 session format that we have in the traditional FYF groups, but we shortened the length of the session. It was not manageable to have a 90 minute session for most of our teens. So the majority of our sessions were 45 minutes. Some went up, crept up a little bit more to 60 minutes. We had smaller groups. So rather than expanding up to six families, we tried to cap it around four. Um, and there were a couple groups where we only had two um, teens. Um, but we do really feel strongly that there's value to conduct these um, sessions within the context of group. 
um, families benefit from that support and we as clinicians benefit from the expertise of our families supporting each other. In terms of the treatment modality, we went back and forth about this because within the traditional FYF program, we break out. Um, so all kids and parents present to group and most of you know this, we meet as a large group and then we have some breakout sessions, parent um, only, child only, and then come back um, as a group and then we also have dyadic work. Um, so we struggled with this issue because we wanted to provide in-depth psychoed um, to parents and we decided that we would front load our sessions, have those three sessions really precede the um, introduction of teens to group. And then parents and teens participated together for the duration of group after those three parent sessions. Um, and we did that for a number of reasons. Um, we, many of our teens had communication challenges. We wanted them to be supported with their communication, but we also wanted to transition kind of teens' ability to cope um, outside of setting, uh, of the clinic setting, and we felt strongly that parents could best support that generalization if they were present for the duration. So, um, Let's talk a little bit about some of the components. Like the traditional or original FYF program, we focus on emotion regulation. We felt that this was um, even more critical for this population, the ID population, um, in part because we feel, as I mentioned earlier, that emotion regulation can underlie some of the anxiety symptoms and also some of the problem behaviors. So we played around a lot with how do we teach emotion regulation. And in those three parent sessions that preceded the introduction of teens to group, parents did a lot of the work that is done in the typical um, FYF group by the kids. So parents identified physical symptoms, parents identified um, fears and created videos and pictures to kind of represent what those zones would be. So um, they did a lot of, the parents did a lot of the work to support the implementation. And then we also had to think carefully through problem behavior. So right away, we started off with crisis plans to manage red zone behavior, because without a plan in place, um, parents' anxiety escalates, our anxiety escalates as clinicians, and we really wanted to have a good plan for dangerous behavior. And then we began to introduce the semantic management and the cognitive approaches. And we really thought about those as yellow zone strategies. When the teens were in red, it was not a time to be targeting cognitive um, supports. It was not a time to be teaching somatic management. Modeling somatic management could take place in the red zone, but really the opportunity um, for practice and use of strategies really comes within the yellow and the green zone. So the somatic management component um, will be very familiar to all of you. We really wanted to provide opportunities to transition parent strategy use over to teens. Um, there's been a lot of work in the literature to indicate that individuals with ID often become reliant on parents and caregivers to soothe them and to manage their emotion regulation very early in life. And as a result, um, by adulthood, may really lack a sense of autonomy and control over their own emotion regulation. So this was a primary kind of goal of ours within the context of this group to support teens in becoming self-reliant in their own approaches, um, as opposed to relying on others to soothe them, either by using, by sitting on them, by hugging them, by restraining them. Really, we were trying to um, shift over the control to um, the teens themselves. So we used a lot of visual structure, um, routine, and practice on a daily basis, multiple times a day with school, home, and other providers um, being incorporated. ABA providers have been incredibly helpful. So this is a quick um, visual of one of the structures that we used. You can see we tried to use um, just calming approaches, but take a break um, by 
breathing, the pinwheel, we use lots of different ways to teach deep breathing, chair yoga, uh, sensory techniques like um, squeezing a ball, bouncing a ball, taking a walk, um, taking a sip of water. Um, but really the emphasis is there are options um, and teens can be empowered to use these um, autonomously. Yes, they need support, but the goal is autonomous use. The cognitive component has been very tricky to kind of think through. And we really have tried to pay careful attention to um, perseverative um, questions that many of our kids ask, um, manding behaviors, negative self-talk, and reassurance seeking. And really think carefully through how can we replace, how can we replace some of those negative um, thoughts and um, perseverative state, speech and questions with very basic mantras like, I can do it. Um, even teens with very limited language skills are able to echo and repeat oftentimes um, phrases that highlight their self-confidence and their ability to manage, which is why we try and land on very basic um, approaches like, I can do it. I'm brave. We want to highlight that self-confidence. Um, and we don't really focus on um, challenging the negative cognitions at all. So once again, menus for those kids who are able to read, we have um, I'm brave, I can do it. Obviously for those kids with um, more developed um, language, those um, helpful thoughts can be a little bit more um, complex. But we really do like to rely on um, simple mantras that can be recycled across um, scenarios, so are not overly specific. Um, we wanted to give you a few examples of some of the exposure hierarchies and some of the fears that our teens have faced, because um, sometimes there's a misperception that um, teens with ASD and ID might not have symptoms of generalized anxiety. And that was absolutely not the case for the population we worked with. There were lots of, the majority of the fears, I should be clear, that we targeted were social and specific phobias. But there was absolutely a subset of the group that we worked with who experienced GAD. And we listed some of these examples because we think they're very interesting and they could be somewhat unique to this population. So lots of fear about future functioning. Will I be able to be independent? Will I be able to learn to drive? Um, I don't want to be with teens who look different, who look weird. I want to be um, perceived as typical. And that can lead to significant anxiety as well. Um, lots of classic specific phobias, dental medical procedures. Um, and given the medical complexity of this population, we feel like tackling those um, dental and medical um, phobias are critical. Um, it can really reduce life expectancy if you're not able to attend dental appointments, medical appointments, there can be grave consequences. So those are a top um, priority. Um, and then the social fears are very, um, similar to what you may see in the original Facing Your Fear um, groups. Um, one difference between the original kind of Facing Your Fears and the IDD adaptation is the emphasis that we place on daily routines. Um, we really emphasize that not only the somatic management, the cognitive um, approaches, but also facing fears have to be done daily. Um, and that's because they need to be part of a routine. We also know that teens with ID require a lot of repetition, a lot of practice to be able to acquire new skills. And for many of the teens we worked with, somatic management and helpful thoughts were new skills. So creating visual structure, creating visual routine is critical. And once again, um, buy-in may be reduced. So there may not be as much motivation to engage in exposure. So creating a routine and creating clear-cut rewards um, are really helpful. We also devoted time every single week to share accounts of bravery. Um, once again, the purpose behind this is to um, really reinforce a brave identity. And so we had teens, each group, bring in their camera, show us a video of something they did that was brave that week. Um, even if their language was not um, 
to the point where they could narrate their brave acts, simply showing a video or having a parent show a video of their bravery was very critical in our mind. So um, I'm gonna hand it back to Judy um, to talk about school settings. Um, and there's a lot more to be said and a lot more work to be done to be clear with the FYFID population. Um, but let's focus on the schools now. All right, great. Thanks, Audrey. So we're at the third part of this uh, adaptation presentation, right? So we've done telehealth and um, Audrey just did uh, our program for teens with IDD. And now we're going to spend the last part of this section talking about the importance of working in schools and what we've done for our school adaptation. Um, all right, so you all are on this call, so you must know that uh, our students with ASD do um, display lots of challenges in school settings and anxiety is absolutely one of them. And, uh, you know, we feel like it's the perfect setting to be able to do an adaptation of CBT because we have really experienced interdisciplinary school providers who are already working with our kids. And it just feels like uh, the next logical step to tack on an evidence-based intervention for, for those folks to, because they're already having to deal with the challenging behaviors. So why not introduce them to, uh, to this kind of a program? Um, lots of times evidence-based practice is unavailable in school settings. And they're really the location of choice because it's where the problem behaviors and anxiety behaviors occur. And we think it might enhance generalization, although we haven't um, looked at that empirically just yet. So our initial adaptation of Facing Your Fears happened in Singapore with my friend, good friend and colleague, Irene Dermick, who's a psychologist in uh, Toronto. And we went to Singapore three times and uh, worked with them very diligently, worked with um, Dr. Mariam Aljaned, a psychologist there at uh, the Ministry of Education. And we were trying to figure out how do you adapt a clinic-based program that was developed in the US for Singaporean students in a school context. So the students there were ages 13 to 15. And I would encourage you to look at this paper if you haven't seen it, because we go into great detail about how we um, uh, developed the collaboration and how we proceeded. But the bottom line is that we felt um, like the, the results are really encouraging. Um, kids um, improved in terms of their anxiety according to both their report and their parents' report. And uh, the providers who were non-mental um, health people, they were educators in Singapore who delivered it, um, felt like it was a doable, feasible program. And uh, at last count, when I talked with um, uh, Dr. Aljaned, she told me that it was in um, nearly half of the secondary schools in Singapore. So I feel like that's our goal always, is to try to implement clinic-based programs into real world, world settings. So with that success, we, we live in Colorado, and uh, we were able to secure a grant to work with uh, these three public schools, at least for now, in our um, home state, Denver Public Schools, Littleton, and Cherry Creek. Um, it's really important to note that we were very interested, not just in translating the Facing Your Fear clinic-based program to public schools, but we were really interested in working with schools um, that had populations of uh, traditionally underserved students. So uh, students from African-American backgrounds, Latinx backgrounds, low-income backgrounds. Um, and the reason we did that is because um, communities of color are, um, uh, have incredible challenges in accessing um, healthcare. There's tremendous disparities in access to care, and we felt like we wanted to start there. Um, and the truth is, communities of color are hurting right now, as they have been for, for for many, many years. And I feel like it's been an important part of our research to, um, to work with the communities um, who experience the same rates, if not higher rates of mental health, um, and to, um, to give the educators in that, those communities tools to work with our students. So we began this project, you know, we'd already had the Singapore adaptation, but we wanted to see if there was something different we needed to think about for public schools in Colorado. Um, there were some differences, um, as you might imagine, um, and some things stayed the same, but we convened a number of focus groups, probably 14 focus groups over the first year of this project, and we asked people, would you be willing to do this project in, you know, to, to deliver Facing Your Fears in public schools in Colorado? Who do you think should deliver it? What students do you think this program is most appropriate for? What would this program look like to make it be feasible? Um, 
we were very interested in sustainability, not just training people and saying good luck for the duration of the project, but really wanting it to stick. So it was important to us that we had community collaboration from day one who could inform what this program could look like and what the materials could look like. So this is what we landed on. And um, the end of 29 is from the first pilot year. We're actually finishing up a randomized control trial right now, but the first pilot year was last academic year, 2018 and 2019. We landed on having students with a known ed ID or medical diagnosis of autism or social communication challenges similar to ASD. We know that there are plenty of students who are waiting to get a diagnosis um, and who don't have one. And we did not want to eliminate those same students and somehow penalize them for not having the, the kind of right label. We wanted to make sure that whoever we felt like could benefit from this program could be included. Um, they had to have interfering anxiety, estimated IQ above 70, um, and um, in second to eighth grade. We were very interested, and that's why I'm so excited to always see non-mental health people on a call like this, because we wanted this to be interdisciplinary. We did not want this to be the purview of um, school psychology only. And in our first year, you can see this is kind of the percentages of uh, disciplines that were represented. Um, and again, that was last year. I don't have the data from this year, um, but you can see it's a pretty good mix of folks with different experiences, which we value. This is what the program looks like now. This is our sort of second version. We had a pilot version that was a little bit longer. Um, we got a lot of feedback from people after the first year, and this is what we've landed on as it stands. So you can see it's a total of 12 sessions, um, and it, they last roughly 40 minutes. Some school teams will tell you it takes longer than 40 minutes. Some will tell you they could do it in less than 40 minutes. Um, we, if you look at the content, which I'm not going to spend too much time going over, but if you know Facing Your Fears, the titles of those sessions are going to look really similar to the psychoed that we do in Facing Your Fears, as well as the exposure that we do in uh, Facing Your Fears. So we tried to cover everything, um, but you can see the overall dosage of the program is shorter. Uh, there are two parent contacts, and it's contacts, not sessions. Because the first one, we try to encourage face-to-face -face meetings with families. The second is we have a YouTube link that talks about content that we send to the families. We also have handouts and kind of goal sheets that we send to the, both the school teams, working with the students, as well as the family. So everybody is very well aware of what the kids are working on in this program. And um, people have really liked, I think, the updates, and it's helped with generalization. <clears throat> so what are the core components? <clears throat> Excuse me. Psychoed is a big piece, as you would imagine. So it's not going to look really that different from the clinic based. We have to pay attention to kids' emotion vocabulary. What words do they use to describe their anxious symptoms? We have to help them identify anxiety because, as you know, um, in, whether it's in school or a clinic or wherever it might be, some of our guys have trouble figuring out what is anxiety and actually don't like the word anxiety anyway. They don't like it, they don't want to be use that word to describe themselves. Um, and so we have to spend some time thinking about that. Um, we help them identify what's happening in their bodies. Um, and then of course, helping them calm down because many of our guys have some problems with emotion regulation in addition to anxiety. They can be related, but they can also um, be somewhat separate in that we have some very specific uh, strategies of the stressometers and those sorts of things to help kids calm down, similar to what Audrey showed with the um, kind of red, yellow, and green zones. There's plenty of programs like that out there. It doesn't have to be what we use, but, um, but we do think it's an important skill to help somebody figure out how to calm themselves down. And we call it the play to get the green. Uh, I showed this in the webinar a couple of weeks ago, but for folks who maybe are just tuning in this time, I wanted to show you um, how we take a similar uh, worksheet that's in the clinic-based program and how the items on here, so the everybody worries sometimes, um, are related to school-based fears. And um, uh, so, so just to give you a sense of how we've kind of updated them. We also do, in addition to psychoed, we do exposure. We have to do exposure. It's a little tricky to figure out how to do it in the school setting. And to be honest, I think we're still trying to figure that out. But our school teams have led the way for us and have done an incredible job of doing exposure practice. 
Um, but again, you have to identify what fears are getting in the way. Do a hierarchy, start from most to least, just or least to most, um, and practice them a little bit at a time. Um, here's an example of one of the exposure hierarchies that some of our kids have absolutely faced in schools, but also we made little videos so that you might recall in the clinic-based program, we have uh, facing your fear of dogs and facing your fear of talking on the phone. In the school-based program, we have facing your fear of toilets flushing, so using the public bathroom, the school bathroom. So these would be some graded exposure steps to be able to do that. Student just stands outside the bathroom door and the toilet flushes, is in the doorway of the bathroom and the toilet's flushing, gets closer, flushes the toilet himself, and then stands close to a stall um, next, and several students, and then uh, peer washes his hand and then the toilets are flushing. Uh, we do have video, so we use mo video modeling just like we do in the original program. So our videos are toilets flushing, facing your fear of making mistakes, which is a big one in schools, and facing your fear of talking to um, talking to people, I think is the third one. Um, kids really seem to like those videos as I think they do in the, in the clinic-based program. What are some of the common fears our guys have been facing, our school teams uh, have told us about? Well, as you might imagine, back when we could eat with each other at a cafeteria, they were uh, facing your fears of going to the cafeteria or just kind of social fears in general. Um, using the bathroom, that was a big one for a number of students. Fire alarms, as you might imagine, was as well, making mistakes. Um, insects, so uh, fear of having some trouble going out uh, for recess because of um, bees and bugs and those sorts of things. The dark was another one for our guys, a common fear, but we did see it in schools too. And then of course the social ones, coming in late, asking for help, talking and presenting in class. And you can really see how those fears interfere with somebody's uh, ability to do well in a school setting. Here what's what we, uh, at the end of, let's see, I guess at the end of this year, this is the, some of the materials that our school teams were able to get from us. They got a Facing Your Fears bag with a really cool logo that was created by uh, a participant in Facing Your Fears uh, uh, several years ago. Um, there's a school-based version, student workbooks, uh, facilitator manual, and, and some worksheets for parents. And I don't know if you can see what that is, but it's a lanyard, but it's not just any lanyard. It actually is a USB that has all the materials electronically. Um, and if there are school folks on the call, certainly we realize that, um, that we wanted to make this as, sim as easy um, as possible that could fit within a crazy busy school day. So we wanted to have everything pulled together all in one place so that as folks are scrambling to go from one thing to another, you have everything available to you. Um, I wanted to show you uh, just kind of how we've expanded in these three districts. So the 2018-2019 uh, academic year um, was our pilot year to see if this was really feasible. This past academic year, 2019-2020, we've done a, um, a randomized trial. And I'm just trying to give you a sense of scope. We used a train-the-trainer approach, which I can explain more um, later if folks are interested but we were able to randomize 27 school teams across these three districts, um, whereas we had 13 were able to get the treatment the first semester, and then 14 were getting it the second semester. I'm just wanting to get you a sense about the scope. So um, at the end of the day, we worked with 81 students and uh, 39 in our fall cohort and 42 in the spring. So we're excited to look at that data. I don't have the results to share with you of the anxiety pieces yet, but, um, but I'm excited to share at some point. But I do have acceptability data and uh, it's important in any feasibility trial to sort of see um, if people like what you're doing and if it's really doable. So we asked school providers is this easy to understand and can you put it in practice? So you can see the vast majority either strongly agreed or agreed that the program was easy to do. That's important to us. It's not, if, if it's not easy, people aren't gonna sustain it in a school setting. Um, we also asked if uh, school providers felt like it could enhance their ability to manage their students' anxiety. And again, that was important to us. That was the whole point of this program. And again, mostly strongly agree or agree with that response. We asked parents, now remember parents were involved, but not a lot. Um, and we asked them, do you think your child is less anxious after participating? 
and you can see it's not everybody and we certainly wouldn't expect it to be everybody but the um, majority of parent respondents um, said either agree or strongly agree to feeling like they could see some um, less anxious behaviors in their in their own kids and we also wanted to ask the students directly like do you like it was this even fun for you and you could see again um, and our guys are tough critics, so we were happy to see that the uh, majority of people felt like it was a fun program for them. And um, do you feel better? So we're really wanting to know if their anxiety had decreased. And again, you can see that um, it's not everybody, but it certainly is a, is a majority of folks who felt like um, that it was helpful to them. This is from our uh, pilot year, which I'm just about ready to submit for um, uh, peer review and uh, we did have significant reductions in anxiety from pre post according to both student report and parent report of that intent to treat sample in um, in the first pilot year so the results are encouraging there's a lot more work to be done but we feel like we've got a, a good start um, I want to acknowledge before we end and uh, talk to the group for questions this is an advisory board that I established uh, for our project, um, gosh, at the beginning of, the pro of when our funding period, which is three years ago. We have representatives from our community as well as um, the three districts. So a lot of kudos to those guys. They've really informed a lot of these processes. Um, this is our school-based team, a lot of the clinicians who are working on this project with our school-based partners. And summary, final thoughts. So you might wonder why this is blank. Um, maybe you're wondering if we have any final thoughts. Um, we do actually, but I pulled up the um, second to last version of this PowerPoint as opposed to the very last version. So I will, so you probably have it in front of you or will have access to it when you look at the PowerPoint. But the final thoughts are this. One is that um, we feel like it's really important to attend to um, the mental health needs of folks across the um, autism spectrum and and across contexts. Uh, I'm hoping that you can see that we've demonstrated our desire to do that and that it is doable. It's it's different and it's challenging, but it's absolutely, I th we think, what we need to be doing. And the reason for that, of course, is because our families and, and um, kids live in the communities and not everybody can make it to clinic settings. In fact, very many, very few people could make it to a clinic setting. So whatever we could be doing actively to try to um, increase access to care is what we want to be doing. So I think those are our final thoughts. And with that, I think I'll invite Audrey to come back on um, and we can talk through the chat. I've tried to answer her some of the questions that people had about the FYFID um, through private chats, um, but happy to answer um, some of them quickly um, for the full group. So in term, sorry, I'm trying to scroll back up to the beginning of the chat. Um, in terms of, um, I'll do a few of them quickly. By SIB, we meant self-injurious behavior. We had children or teens, I should say, with hand-to-head um, -head behavior, biting the hand is very common, um, dropping to the floor, tantrums, um, and they were included in the group. Um, we did have to indiv individualize behavior plans. Um, in terms of assessing the source of problem behavior, we had parents do um, ABC um, tracking, so antecedents, behavior, consequence. We did a lengthy functional assessment interview to attempt to look at problem behavior and what the, what the function of the problem behavior um, was. And we also did um, anxiety questionnaires and um, interviews tied to anxiety symptoms. Um, sorry, let me keep going. Um, um, the use of ACT for negative self-talk. Um, I think it's really interesting. We have not used ACT within the context of our groups, um, but absolutely feel free to explore its use. Um, we try to ignore negative self-talk and really focus um, strongly on reinforcing um, helpful thoughts. And we try not to go overly positive. We try and have um, the helpful thoughts be kind of neutral. I can handle it. I can cope. 
Um, Judy, I don't know if there are other that you want to kind of jump in. Yeah, let me, let me just say one other thing about ACT. And that is that I would say that while we don't do it formally, I would say that um, for our older kids and for kids who really have trouble with that kind of obsessive thinking and they can't get their thoughts out of their head and that and that the more you sort of um, try to do an active mindful thought paradigm, it just makes things worse. I would say that we do use some more principles informally for that way. Some of our kids have really appreciated a substitute thought. Like it hasn't occurred to them to have a, that you can actually change a thought and, uh, and have it be uh, more positive that might then lead to more positive behaviors. Um, so that's what I would say. So if, if there are folks on the call who have a lot of experience with ACT or mindfulness or other kinds of approaches, I would say absolutely. And especially the older kids can, can make good use of that. Um, I was gonna address the one around early childhood. Um, you know, early, I love early childhood settings in that this is our wonderful place to begin to think about almost prevention of clinical symptoms. So you might be working in an environment with students with, um, with ASD who you might see are subclinical, so maybe not showing full-on signs of anxiety, but who might be, um, uh, you can tell, feeling like they could develop more um, significant symptoms as they get older. And a couple of main things that I would be thinking about is seeing if you can identify what kinds of things might be making them anxious. So knowing what we know about early development, it could be some specific phobias, it could be separation. Um, and that what you would wanna be doing is thinking about how you can encourage and or reward small acts of bravery so that our kids don't get um, such small worlds that they don't have to sort of face their fears. And this is maybe a, a little bit of a soapbox that I'll get on for a second, but, um, but I know that sometimes um, in the autism world, we have spent some time really trying to um, protect our kids from managing lots of um, uh, stimuli that are overwhelming for them. And I'm certainly not saying we shouldn't do that, but what I am saying is if that's the only approach that we do for kids who have aversions to loud noises and to um, other kinds of input, um, and if the only thing to do is to help them avoid, we fear that they won't be able to handle themselves in situations where they're not able to avoid. Um, so that would look like if we have kids that, that um, have problems with um, dark rooms in preschool settings or loud noises, you would want to introduce them to whether it's dark rooms or um, toilets flushing or alarms, whatever that might be in small graded steps so that they could also have the opportunity to um, sort of be brave. You would want to use that language like you're being brave. And I don't know what level of understanding they might have, but you might need a concrete reward that you would pair with that to kind of really convey like this is a good thing. Um, so that's how I would think about it in um, at least a, a beginning in, in early childhood. Um, Audrey, did you have, was there another one? Um. Oh, okay, there was one about the um, school pilot. So the, um, the people who actually implement it were school providers. So we had um, doctors, um, uh, speech pathologists, OT, special educators, behavioral consultants, I think were the vast majority. And Audrey and I in that first year served as um, kind of the, the trainers, if you will of that first year. And then the truth is we had our schools pick interested in training their colleagues. So this last year, we partnered with those trainers and they turned around and trained their colleagues because we really are interested in sustaining this program. So to have a train the trainer approach to get out of there, to get out the research team out of there and have it be a sustainable model where and begin to train themselves in this approach was exactly what we were trying to go for. We also um, did have the chance to do some of the school-based program um, virtually. Um, unfortunately, our local schools kind of shut down um, early, halfway through our semester, 
early in March, and some of these school programs continued um, to run groups, and both Judy and I consulted with several teams um, that did conduct the school-based groups um, via telehealth, and they had some nice success. Um, we, we don't have the empirical results yet, but some of the groups really did feel like they were able to maintain their connections um, with their students um, via um, a telehealth medium. The other thing I'll add to that is we actually used Zoom throughout this whole year of um, having, because you know, it was train the trainer. So we had ourselves partner with trainers who then coached their colleagues in, um, who were looking at it for the first time. And all of that coaching happened over Zoom. We were well, they were well versed with Zoom before everything shifted in mid-March. But as Audrey said, you know, we're playing around with having a virtual curriculum for all the but, um, Yeah, and what was interesting about that is some of the school teams, um, they had um, provided devices for their students and the parents were not involved in the delivery. So I watched a number of groups where kids were set up with their own device at home independently um, connecting with the school teams, um, which was surprising to me. I would have thought adults um, would need to be included a little bit more, but that was impossible for all of our families. Um, a couple more questions. So yes, we do think that the school-based intervention could be done virtually. Um, for the um, discerning between escape-maintained behaviors for the IDD group um, that were more akin to anxiety as compared to non-compliance, um, Lewis Hagopian has done a lot of research on anxiety in people with ASD and ID, and he describes the difference between um, avoidance of non-preferred items versus anxious avoidance is really um, a byproduct of um, anxious behavior. So you can really try and have parents take note of the difference between um, avoiding items because they don't, their child does not want to engage in the activity versus um, avoidance because they're anxious and what kind of physiological symptoms um, become apparent, what kind of visible behaviors um, can be tracked over time. So we look for that, which was why in part we were doing ABC data sheets um, in the beginning of group to kind of differentiate that. Um, it is hard. <laughs> I mean, the bottom line is it really does take um, a very nuanced view and careful tracking. And some parents are more experienced um, in thinking about mental health symptoms. Other parents may need a little bit of support to really consider the role that anxiety may play. Um, I wanted to answer the one on what are our thoughts on implementing a group with uh, youth with a, uh, FASD diagnoses. I would say a couple of things. One is um, some colleagues and friends who I think might be on the call from the University of Calgary have thought about this actually. And um, we've talked with other groups about can you do this with kids that don't have autism or no autism? And our answer is yes. So that, um, you know, we just develop, whether it's the school based program or any kind of version. Our whole point is to try to make CBT accessible to different kinds of learners. And I would say that kids with FASD are, are a different kind of learner. Um, and because in some ways, um, CBT without modifications might be hard for, for some students to grasp in the, given the abstract language-based nature of those programs. So we've been really careful to not have our programs be autism focused. We've been really careful to have them be anxiety focused. Um, but it's just that the curriculum itself is, um, we like to think is accessible for folks who might um, have uh, learning styles that are more amenable to a lot of visual support and structure. So we would say yes. Um, we don't have the data for that and we're hoping that our, our colleagues at Calgary and other places um, will, will have some good data to, um, uh, to um, share. But yeah, we would, we would encourage you to give it a whirl. Um, so there is a question about how extensively FYF has been deployed locally or more widely. Um, we would say it's been widely used and studied. We have, um, and Judy can speak to the research component. Um, 
we have a number of research studies examining its effectiveness within our own lab, um, but also outside of our clinic as well. Um, I believe we have on, Judy, is this right? We have um, research articles listed on our website tied to um, its use. I'm not sure if it's updated, but. The, um, currently updated, but, um, you know, I guess I don't know. The, the answer, you never really know once you kind of publish something, who picks it up, and who does it. Um, and that's sort of the intent is to put it in the hands of folks like many of you who, who have a PT background and who want to be able to, um, to do a program like this. Um, and in many ways, it doesn't even, you know, we're not trying to say it, facing your fears is actually the only way to address anxious symptoms in our population. There are, there are other really good CBT programs that have been modified for, for kids on the spectrum. And so we would encourage you to use um, not just, you know, not just facing your fears if it's not available in your community, but to see if there are other programs that are available in your community. So there's there might be Coping Cat, um, Coping Bear, there might be Biaka, which is Jeff Wood's program. Um, so there are a number of other CBT programs that have been modified for kids on the spectrum. And so I would say feel free to, um, to um, work with some of those folks um, as well. I would also say we have a, 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 a strong presence in Canada. We have a lot of our Canadian colleagues are on this call right now. and. Um, I've done a number of trainings there, Audrey and I both have, and I feel like it's been a good fit for a lot of the, um, the um, universities and agencies that we've worked with up there. Um, adapting. And FYF for average IQ students, a school-based pro um, program um, has very broad inclusion criteria and um, a number of these students also have experienced trauma. Um, and we also focus on the issue of emotion regulation. So within the school-based program, we wanted to be as inclusive as possible. So we, part of the inclusion criteria was including students with IEPs um, who may not have had access to medical evals with medical diagnoses of ASD, um, but who had elevated social communication challenges um, as reflected on their IEP um, and also reflected on the SRS. Um, but we have not done the program specifically for trauma. Um, that is not the, um, the goal of our program, but some of the students who have participated have experienced trauma as well. Anything else you would say about that, Judy? I would agree, and that is that um, our remembering the complexity of our students, right, is that um, our folks are at high risk for developing all kinds of co-occurring mental health symptoms, and we've historically tried to be as inclusive as we could possibly be in our research studies because that reflects the real world. Um, one or two anxiety diagnoses and nothing else is not is not part of our, the folks that we work with. And so it was really important for us to have as um, authentic samples as possible. But I think the only thing we, um, it's, it's rare to have an exclusion from us unless it's a, so significant challenging behavior that kids can't participate in a group or really need another approach. So if you've got depression or trauma that is a problem, really need a, an approach, an intervention specific to those set of symptoms, you would want to get those symptoms If on the other hand, um, you also you have trauma and depression or other issues, but anxiety really seems to be at the forefront, then this would be a good um, So I guess that's the only other thing I might add. Um, I think we're just about time at time. Um, what I Say for folks, you, these are great questions, you guys. You're really very thoughtful in um, in a lot of uh, that you put out in the chat. What I would say to you is, you have our email addresses. Uh, we want you to feel free to email us um, if, if there's some uh, specific information that you want to know that we just couldn't um, capture today. We're happy to do so. Um, and with that, Audrey, do you have any final words before we sign up? No, just very um, thankful for your attention and um, involvement in this program. Um, 
very interested to um, follow up with people who are interested. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, oh, somebody wanted the emails again. You know what? I think um, it should be on the handout, but I'm going to go right to the first page. Um, and we'll put that up for just a few minutes here. Um, and people can take a look at, the, at our, um, our emails. And the PowerPoint, I think, will be on um, recorded and then put up on our website. I just get All right. All right. Thanks, everybody. All right. Maybe we'll sign off now. I think this is a, probably a good time. All right.